Here to discuss the year in branding and corporate controversies is Americus Reed. He is Wharton School of Business professor and a CNBC contributor. Americus, great to have you. I mean, what really jumps out to you as kind of the, the peak of corporate battlegrounds this year? I appreciate the opportunity. Happy holidays to you, uh, Kelly and Tyler. I think a couple of things jump out to me. We're, we are in the year of crisis, clearly. And from my perspective, one of the things that's really important is that now companies are getting involved in these political, partisan, ideological uh, components to attempt to try to build purpose into what they're doing. So when you look at, for example, some of the biggest controversies of 2022, you have to, I think, start with Florida uh, and Disney, a, a venerable brand, absolutely iconic brand, uh, really coming out and mishandling a kind of important kind of aspect with respect to uh, taking a, a, a very sort of strong stance on the LGBTQ plus uh, laws that were kind of coming around with DeSantis and others, and, and really sort of misplaying that. And I think, you know, the biggest controversies come about when brands are not really sure about what they're trying to do and not really focused on coming out with a clear message. And I think you saw that with Florida uh, and Disney going back and forth with respect to this battle now uh, of trying to to maintain a kind of corporate culture, but also be very clear about signaling to uh, employees and the world uh, about what you stand for. And so I think that's a big component of what we're seeing around a lot of controversies, uh, Kelly and Tyler, and that's the idea that companies are, are basically going on and saying the decision calculus is quite clear and we need to take a stand on these issues and we, and we need to be very clear about what that stand is from jump. We don't want to wait until the, the the votes are in, if you will, to use a pun. Uh, we want to be able to be very clear about our mission, our values, our statements, all of these things, and we can avoid situations like Disney uh, saw in that particular is, instance. It, I guess what what's running through my mind, Americus, here is a question of whether silence is an option in these cases, where you where a company like Disney is pulled into a, a legislative controversy like what took place in Florida. It, and so is there an argument that companies legitimately can say, well, we're just not going to get involved in, in this discussion, or must they, because of the nature of their constituencies whether it, and stakeholders, whether it is employees or shareholders or customers who are um, impacted uh, positively or negatively by a law like the one that was uh, in Florida? It's a great point, Tyler. I think the answer, it, we're in a new world, a new playbook. The answer is you can't be silent because what's going to happen is your rivals are going to fill that silence with information about you that probably is going to do more damage than just coming out and being forthright and being very clear about what it is that you stand for. So I think the research is very clear on this, Tyler, and that's the idea that you're better off, even if you come out and you go in opposition to very clear uh, political and ideological lines, that's better than being willy-nilly and sort of wishy-washy and not really trying, or trying to hide behind the scenes. And I think especially consumers now are demanding to know you know, what do you stand for? And they want to know, and they don't want to wait around to see what happens. They want you to be very clear, for better or for worse, as to where these lines are being drawn and where the company comes out on those mm -hmm. issues. I don't know. Call me old school, Americus, but I, I, I worry about the, if all companies feel like they have to make a choice, that fundamentally comes down to painting themselves kind of red or blue. And maybe that's the culture we live in, but I, I hate to see it sort of proceed further that way. Let me ask you, I mean, is, what do we learn from the Adidas uh, example here? Just is, is it a case where they should have moved more quickly or do you think they're applauded for kind of going one way and then pivoting the other? And I don't know if we want to sort of talk about that one or to move on and talk about what Elon Musk should do here in the next chapter of Tesla and Twitter, because that one's just such a unique situation. I'm not sure there's yeah. any larger takeaways to glean from it. Yeah, it's a great point, uh, Kelly. I think that, you know, yay, unfortunately, didn't have a good yay year uh, mm -hmm. because of, of, of what's going on. And I think Adidas was very clear on, you know, they, it seemed like it was a late move, Kelly, but I think what was going on there was, in that situation at least, was that the lawyers wanted to make sure that when they dropped him that this was going to be airtight and all that the contractual aspects of the relationship were 
were really buttoned up. So I, I think that was I think it was very clear early on that once things went way sideways in this anti-Semitic sort of perspective, that there was really no choice, no degrees of freedom uh, for Adidas to change, uh, but but to change and and to sort of get rid of uh, a yay, so to speak. And but, you know, when you're talking about the personal brand, that's billions of dollars that disappear overnight. And so you got to be really careful about that. Well, that, yeah, yeah, that you're exactly right. I mean, that was I think I forget what it was. It was the two billion or twenty percent of their revenue comes came from yay, yay. But yay, as you point out, yay gets a boo. Uh, anyhow, America's Reed, <laughs> have a great holiday season, my friend. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the opportunity.